evening, everyone. I'm Leslie Gordon, Executive Director of the Bremen Museum, and we're here tonight broadcasting from the Bremen in Midtown Atlanta to present Jews and Jazz Part Two. So I'm happy to be here tonight with Gordon Vernick and Gary Motley. Thank you for joining us, and uh, take it away.
are so happy to be back, Jews and Jazz Part Two. Um, with the first um, concert that we did, we, we uh, focused on some important um, Jewish composers. Um, I guess probably the, be the better known of, of the three or four that we, 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 we focused on include Jerome Kern, of course, and, and Irving Berlin and George Gershwin, who were really, really important tunesmiths. They contributed an incredible body of musical literature that really shaped um, not so much jazz itself, but it gave the great jazz musicians this incredible material <clears throat> that they were able to manipulate. In, in, and of course, in jazz, we always encourage our performers to change the melodies, change the harmonies, but they gave us such great material. Uh, absolutely. Um, one of the interesting things uh, in doing uh, the song that we just performed, um, a slightly different twist there. One of the things that really characterizes a lot of the music of these composers is really strong melodies. So even though we did something that was a little uh, juxtaposition in terms of uh, the style that we presented the tune in, the melody is still there and it still really presses through and that was one of the things that was characteristic of a lot of the composers uh, from that period. Absolutely. Um, jazz musicians love to take material. We look at material like this, like, like a silly putty or, or clay, and then we manipulate it. Um, and every night we play it, it's different. And every band that records this music, whether it's a singer or an instrumental ensemble, does it differently. Um, and that's, so it's, it's so important. Now, the first song we played was called Get Happy. Now, this was written by um, uh, Harold Arlen, one of my favorite composers. And the lyricist was uh, Ted Kohler. Um, Harold Arlen, his real name was Arluck, and he was from Buffalo, of all places, the son of a cantor. And he started out in the late 20s. Um, he was trying to break into Broadway, write musicals, write musical review um, uh, stuff. Um, the, uh, maybe uh, as the, the film industry was really getting started, they also needed music. But he really couldn't get much of a start, so he became a rehearsal pianist. And apparently, um, there was a show going on uh, somewhere in Broadway. It could have been um, on Broadway or maybe up in Harlem because they used to do wonderful reviews in Harlem. Um, a review is like a, a, a musical, but it's not really tied together with a theme or a story. It's just a series of, of musical vignettes that are presented. So back to the story. So um, Fletcher Henderson was the rehearsal pianist. He could not be um, at the rehearsal. So um, young uh, Harold Arlen was there and he sits down and he'd been thinking about all different kinds of melodies and, and he used to love to improvise and he started to play, can you play that opening phrase to the um, Get Happy please? Yeah. Okay, so um, um, Arlen had heard that probably from a church in Harlem and it's a kind of a revival sounding, it has very much like a sound of a spiritual. And he heard that, and he heard that, and he was improvising around. And as the story goes, Will Marion Cook, who was a very important African American composer, um, in his own right, was in the audience, was uh, was listening to this rehearsal, and he said, "Young man, that's a nice piece of music you got right there. You better write a melody on that and copyright it." And he wrote that in 1929, and it first appeared in 1930 in a review. It was called the 915 Review. Um, and from 1930, of course, people who made this song famous, you know, a great instrumentalist, but one of the great versions was, of course, Judy Garland's version. Mm -hmm. It was just a spine-tingling performance. So um, the next song we're going to do is um, written by Jay Gorney, who's not as well-known as Arlen, but is also a great um, tunesmith. And the lyrics of this song are written by one of my favorite lyricist, one of my favorite Jewish lyricists. I love Mercer, um, but he doesn't really fall into this category. And his name was Yip Harbor. Yip was the, co the social conscience of Broadway. He, um, back in those days, in the 1930s, you know, the, uh, the, the children of the immigrants from Eastern Europe were, you know, came from Russia, from Poland, and they had a lot of what I guess you would call leftist or red leanings. But it was more about social consciousness than about, you know, pure communism. And Harbor, we're gonna talk about him later, he wrote some of the most amazing lyrics. Now, he wrote a song in 1932, and he called it Brother Can You Spare a Dime. It's one of the most heartfelt <coughs> songs I think I've ever heard. It's, it's a real tearjerker. And it's a story about a man who was a World War I vet. He comes back to the country, to the USA, and he's doing quite well between 19, say 1919 and 1929. He's working in the railroad, he's doing quite well, and of course by 1930, everything is gone. 
it's just that we're in the midst of the depression and it tells a story you know he used to work on the railroad it, it's a really an amazing story and the way it was put to um to music is, is very powerful and another real important thing about this song is that the melody itself is based on a cantorial theme which hopefully you'll be able to hear so this is uh jay gorney and uh music by jay gorney and lyrics by yip harburg brother can you spare a dime that's right um Bing Crosby recorded this. Oh, probably um, every important singer in the 1930s, yeah. 40s, and 50s. Um, and those early recordings, of course, they you know they sound so dated now, but <laughs> it was a very powerful, powerful piece of music uh, coming from one of the great lyricists of that era. <laughs> right on it. Mm -hmm. Go on. Thank you. 
hope you could hear that kind of Eastern uh, flavor to the melody that um, Gorney wrote, um, but the lyrics are just um, very, very heartfelt and very, very touching. Um, <clears throat> we're going to go back to Harold Arlen um, for, uh, for our next song. Now, um, Arlen collaborated with a lot of great um, lyricists, and one of his um, favorites besides Yip Harbor was a man by the name of Ted Kohler and they wrote a lot of songs together. And uh, this next song is called I've Got the World on a String. Most of you will re recognize the song, made famous by lots of singers. Um, probably the most famously is uh, Frank Sinatra. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a, it's a great tune. And, and as Gary said, the melodies that these guys wrote were so strong, um, but they really lent themselves <clears throat> to lots of different kinds of interpretations. Um, um, it was first, uh, he wrote it in 1932, and was written for the 21st edition, check this out, of the Cotton Club October series. So not only was um, Arlen writing music for Broadway and for reviews, he was also writing music for Duke Ellington and other performers who were at the Cotton Club at this period. This is the golden age of, of Harlem's music, and especially... Um, uh, the Cotton Club. Of course, um, Ellington was there from 1927 through about 1932, mm -hmm. and then left and went to Europe. And one, I think, was something he might have regretted was um, leaving the Cotton Club because when he left, uh, Fletcher Henderson went in, and of course, Cab Calloway made his first um, big splash, and he spent quite a few years at the Cotton Club. And Ellington was never to go back, except for maybe on a few. Um, uh, a few dates. So I got the world on a string. You're going to love this. And it just lends itself so well to jazz interpretation. And uh, Arlen was one of the great uh, composers who really understood the sensibility of the blues and was able to always incorporate that. You want to give you a little introduction there? Uh, sure. Mr. Motley. Uh, for the tempo you got.
You know, it's interesting, uh, we were talking earlier about um, a lot of the music that came out of this period in the 1930s, and we talked about uh, technology and what was going on, um, that the medium for people listening to music was, was uh, the uh, phonograph. And the maximum amount of time that you could have on a record was three minutes. So we ended up with these really wonderful arrangements where, the, you know, the writers, it's like, you got three minutes to get in and get out, make your statement. You know, and so we end up with these, I think that's where the, the whole notion of a hit record actually started, uh, was with these three minute sides, which is something that still sticks with us, you know, to this day in the recording industry. So you had to have a really strong melody, you had to have a hook, you had to have, you know, these lyrics, the whole package that would um, get people's attention. They also had to be able to dance um, and that sort of thing. Uh, hence the connection to the Cotton Club and a lot of those arrangements that came out of the bands during that period. Um, absolutely. Um, we, we say that Duke Ellington was the master of the three-minute symphony. He mastered it. And all these composers mastered these, these short works. It was not like um, Beethoven would master um, a symphony, which the first move could be 15 minutes long, and then there's sure. a second move and a third move. These, these were massive, massive pieces of, of work, that were, but they were always performed live. When they wanted to sell this music, this was also a business in the phonograph records, um, exactly. in the radio, and of course it was about selling units. But the thing about this music was that it was, it, the product was was so beautiful. It was really amazing, and you're absolutely right. They had to be three minutes long, and they had to have a strong, strong hook. Exactly. Um, and another interesting thing about um, this, and I'd like to hear what you think about this, is that um, if there was a hit song, everybody recorded it. That's true. I mean, it was recorded yes. maybe 300 times during like maybe um, a five to 10 year period, but the people don't do that so much anymore today. If someone has a hit song, they recorded and it's always associated with them, but these, were, these songs were recorded multiple times by many different people. Uh, exactly, the, uh, again, we talk about trends and uh, how those things relate to, to, to the different periods. So a lot of these composers, I guess that this would be a part of the whole Tin Pan Alley, uh, which was basically, um, uh, for those of you in this region, would be the equivalent of, of uh, Music Row in, in Nashville. You know, all of the writers, this is, this is where they gather. And yeah, um, again, when we look at technology, what was available, people were able to hear things on phonograph records, on radio, and we had just arrived from piano rolls and that sort of thing. You know, uh, interestingly enough, Duke Ellington really learned how to play the piano by sitting down at the piano with the, with the uh, piano rolls that would go through the instrument, and the notes would press down, and he said he would put his fingers on the keys to figure out exactly how how to play songs. I've heard that story from many great pianists learn how to, or self-taught that way. Yeah, exactly. But well, yeah, when I, a song became a hit, it was that was the thing. Also, print sheet music made it um, made all of the music available to people in their homes, so you could get a song like this or the, uh, one of the other ones that we played earlier. You could get the sheet music, and people would uh, would gather, you know, in their listening parlors and have their you know gatherings, and someone would sit at the piano and play this, and you would have sing-alongs and that sort of thing. So. That music helped to really usher in kind of a family, um, family setting for for uh, this music and, and entertainment. As Absolutely. I said, kind of a precursor to our notion of pop music, if you will. Absolutely, because th this was popular music, but the um, the depth of the the understanding of, of music and the way they the composers manipulated the the mechanics of the music and the way they married it. Um, to lyrics was really uncanny, and I can think of you know maybe the Beatles in the 1960s that really had that same knack for for marrying great melody with with beautiful lyrics sure. in, 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 in an, um, an amazing original manner. I, I can think of them. I'm sure there are people today that are writing great songs, but they always say they're not writing songs like this anymore, <laughs> and they they really aren't. They're writing different kinds of songs. It's still great music, but this really touches, a, um, I, think, I think, a soft spot in most people's um, memories. The next song we're going to do is um, uh, Yarburg, uh, it's a Harburg piece. Um, he wrote the lyrics to uh, Billy Rose and um, Harold Arlen wrote the melody. And this is a really well-known song. It's called It's Only a Paper Moon. Of course, made famous by the um, 
the 1970s movie with um, Ryan O'Neill and uh, his daughter Tatum O'Neill. Um, it was written for a Broadway play that was called um, The Great Magoo. And, uh, and, and, it, and it, the actual title was um, If You Believed in Me, and then they changed it to It's Only a Paper Moon, because it, this, the, the word If You Believed in Me is also is part of the lyrics. Um, so this is a great, great tune. Um, you playing the melody or am I playing the melody? Uh, well, you play it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure you recognize this, and it's got everything that you always associate with Harold Arlen, wide intervals. In other words, the distance between this note and this note is quite big as opposed to kind of stepwise. And those, it was those wide intervals that really catch your ear. And he was just a master of, of doing this. So it's only a paper moon. One, two,
a fun tune. Yeah. Those songs, they're a mouthful. <clears throat> I gotta tell you, so the lyrics and the way that it just, they match the, the melodies and the rhythms. You know, as I said before, Arlen was really one of the few Tin Pan Alley composers to understand the essence of the blues. And I probably came from him spending time in Harlem and also um, writing for these reviews at the Cotton Club and spending time with Fletcher Henderson. So there was this great cross uh, fertilization of different kinds of music and these great composers um, came up with these, these wonderful songs. And uh, um, Arlen spent a lot of time you know, doing um, Broadway music. Now, at this time, also Hollywood was beginning to call. So some of the um, important composers were going out to the West Coast and writing uh, music for movies because there was a huge demand for um, great music. And of course, what happened in the 1930s is that you're finding great European composers, symphonic composers, um, who were writing for you know orchestras that felt that um, you know Europe in the 1930s was not necessarily a great place to be. And it wasn't really receptive, especially if you were in Germany or Poland or in, in any of those countries. So they began to emigrate. So we also have this incredible golden age of great movie music coming from these amazing um, Eastern European trained musicians. You want to say something about sure. that? Yeah, there was a lot. If, if, if you look at that period, there was a lot that was going on. We're, you know, we're in between world wars here. Um, and we're looking at... Ten Pan Alley and this burst of, of music that happens on that, on that scene at the same time, uh, the Harlem Renaissance. You know, uh, being in New York, you wanted to go hang out where you know things were on the cutting edge and people were uh, bursting in with sharing and, and communicating of ideas. So a lot of these composers were also, you know, going to a Absolutely. lot of the speakeasies, you know, in, in Harlem uh, late night, checking out what was going on with the jazz thing, and as uh, like Gershwin and, and many others. So you've got this cross-pollination of music that happens. Um, the other interesting thing that happened in, in the 1930s, obviously, uh, with the, with the, uh, the crash of the stock market and the, you know, our economy tanked. So uh, as a result, uh, we couldn't afford to have big bands. So the heyday of the big band was essentially being ushered out uh, with that change literally uh, in the market. Uh, but interestingly enough, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, the scene that was starting to open up was, was the music scene uh, in, in, within the film industry. So yes, a lot of the composers then leaving New York and then immigrants as well, as you mentioned, who were also migrating to the West Coast because that's where the jobs were. So uh, it's always interesting when we think about a lot of the small groups. And, you know, I always look at this being a performer, why the music sounded the way that it did when you'd have a... which was a very nice piano style. And uh, there were a number of pianists in small ensemble groups that would really have that type of sound. That sound was created because when we lost the big bands, we lost the sax section, which was the five note voicing, which was that sound. So they shifted that from the big band into the smaller ensembles. They scaled back the musicians. Uh, so it's very interesting to see how the sound changed because of the extraneous things that were happening. And then you mentioned the richness of these uh, lyrics and, and compositions that composers were writing. That was directly a, a result of art imitates the environment from which it emerges. So they were writing about the things that were happening. The love songs about the soldiers going off to war and not knowing if they're going to come back. And we have this last dance and this very sentimental thing. So. Uh, it was a very fertile period as well as a turbulent period, but it was all of that activity that started to spawn off these various things that, that happened. Yeah, it's, it's a very uh, rich time um, musically and culturally. It's, it's very interesting if you think about some of the greatest music and literature and art and uh, um, uh, architecture really comes out of uh, periods in um, our country's history when um, things weren't going so great, um, especially you know during the Depression also. Um, mm -hmm. Roosevelt with the works um, that WPA, you know, also put musicians and artisans back to work. So it was a very interesting period. Um, and people actively went out to seek music. We were still more or less an, an urban society. People were moving to big cities. So Broadway was exploding with music, mm -hmm. not literally, but figuratively. Um, reviews, there were nightclubs, there were bars. So there was places where people could go hear all this music and they needed new music. So these guys were either doing reviews, 
nobody was just writing songs for song's sake. It was always with a, with a specific purpose. Now, as, as I've mentioned a number of times, Arlen, of all the Tin Pan Alley composers, really was able to um, catch the this essence of the blues, and especially when he, com uh, when he collaborated with, with Johnny Mercer, who was from Savannah, and then had that certain lilt in his poetry. But this one is a great tune, and uh, lyrics um, are by Ted Kohler, and he collaborated with Ted a lot, and this is, was a theme song for a lot of great jazz artists in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and it's still performed, mm -hmm. and it's called I Got a Right to Sing the Blues. Oh, also, a lot of these, all these songs had what was called a verse, which precedes the chorus. It's kind of like the setup. If you go to a musical, there's always a kind of rubato section where someone is singing, and they're telling a story, they're kind of setting things up, and then it moves into the song. It could be fast-paced or slow-paced. But this one, we are going to play the verse. We didn't play the verse on the other ones. We went right into what's called the chorus. Okay, um, Gary, you ready? Uh, just one second here. And the verses are generally played out of time. Sometimes we refer to that as rubato. All right, okay. <laughs>
That's a swinger. That was um, also a Jack T. Garden's theme song. Yeah. You talk about a swinging singer and trombonist. He made a whole lot of music out of that. And that's, that's Arlen. You can really sense his, his affinity and his deep respect and understanding of the blues. Because the blues is the cornerstone of American music. It, it is, everything emanates from that, that's the sound of American music. Everything else comes from Europe, but when you hear just a little bit of that, you know exactly where you are. Now, it's been accepted all over the world. We've traveled all over, and I played the blues in every country with musicians. I couldn't even speak their language, but we all understand that this, this is, music is a language, and especially this uh, association with, with the blues and the, and the root system of American music is, is such an important thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we've got time for one more number, and I know we're going to have some questions. No questions? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Um, we're going to do a, I would like to do two, two tunes if we could. Um, you know, there were women composers too. It was, it was a tough field for women to break into. Um, the popular music field, if you were a singer, it was okay, but an instrumentalist or a composer, it was, it was very, very difficult. And there was a young woman, her name was um, Ann Rosenblatt. She was from Omaha, Nebraska. And she wanted to write songs, she wanted to write Broadway shows, and she went to New York and she couldn't, as they say, she couldn't get arrested. No one would, would help her. She went to George Gershwin, and Gershwin said, well, get a job as a rehearsal pianist for a Broadway show. And she did in the early 1930s and was doing pretty well as a rehearsal pianist and was also writing melodies. And she wrote this little melody and as it so happened that Irving Berlin was in this rehearsal and he heard this and he said something like the effect, young lady, you, got, you have a gift here. This, this is something very special. And what she wrote was a song called Willow Weep For Me. She wrote the words and the lyrics, and she went on to have a very um, important and a very fruitful mm -hmm. career um, in Hollywood writing uh, music and lyrics for um, a Disney songs. She wrote, Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf from um, uh, the, one of those Disney pictures. She did a lot of work with uh, Frank Church, I believe, who also wrote mm -hmm. Someday My Prince Will Come. So she, yes. she did a lot of stuff. So it was one of the few women that really made an impact. And this song that she wrote, Willow Weep for Me, is just one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard. Gary.
That was Anne Ronell's Will It Be For Me. We have one more song we'd love to play. Um, Yip Harburg, as I said when we started, was the social conscience of Broadway. And he, um, in the 1950s, he was blacklisted by uh, McCarthy, as were many um, really creative people. Um, artists, writers, actors, musicians, composers, anybody he didn't like. I'm not gonna get into the whole thing right now, but it was really horrible. And Harburg really lost a lot of work and eventually he was able to, able to come back. But he always wanted to write um, a musical about um, a shtetl, a little Jewish village in Eastern Europe. But he, he never did. He, it, that would come later in, in the form of Fiddler on the Roof. But he did the next best thing. He took that shtetl and he turned it into an Irish village and he called it um, Finian's Rainbow. But if you, the subplot of Finian's Rainbow is all about protest. You know, on top of it, you know, it's a very nice lighthearted, but there's some very serious undertones and Harburg was able to inject that in 1947, right before he was blacklisted. One of my favorite songs from Finian's Rainbow is a song that was called Old Devil Moon. Jazz musicians love this song. It's kind of an unusual form. Mm -hmm. And it's got some great chord changes. And we're going to, unless we have some questions, we have one question. Then we'll leave you with Old Devil Moon. I want to thank uh, Leslie Gordon. Also, um, please take a virtual tour of um, Herb Snitzer's um, jazz, um, uh, his photography. You can take a, a virtual tour through um, bremen.org. And the pictures, the photographs are fantastic. And you can just, it's almost like you're there. Question. Someone asked if you could speak on the decline of big band music. Um, I'll, I'll say a few things, and I'm sure Gary will want to add something to that. Um, it was economically, it was not feasible after the Second World War. Styles changed, musical tastes changed. Um, the focus moved away from the bands, which were, was very expensive, and it moved towards smaller groups. Bebop became the new style of jazz, and, and like everything else, it has its day. You know, disco had its uh, a period when it was like really, really popular, and we can go through the history of popular music and find, you know, and it, it had a good 10-year run, 1935 to 1945, and then the focus moved to the singers. So. There's a lot of reasons, musical, economic, social, everything. You can, you can find reasons for that. You want to add something? Uh, exactly, I, I agree. Uh, much, you know, when we look at the conditions and circumstances that we are under right now, we're going through change and entertainment. Everything that we know about our lifestyle here um, is in the process of changing. And years from now, when we look back at all of this, we'll notice how art was influenced and how music and everything changed. So it'll be an interesting study of what was going on in our society at the time. So that with the big band heyday really reflected that period and the change as we started to move forward uh, in our country's history. Yeah, if you're, if you're interested in that, there's, there's some great books and there's articles and there's, there's a lot of information to really kind of address that. It's a great question. Uh, another person, Lisa, at, wants you to talk about Jews in Harlem, how the Jewish composers met the Harlem Renaissance, and, and was that kind of a, a marriage, if you will? I would say from um, the Harlem Renaissance was, was really an amazing time for art and literature and music, but it was also a period when white um, composers and musicians w were comfortable going to Harlem and, and to these night spots, and there was a certain cachet to go there and become, and, and the Harlem Renaissance was, a, it was an amazing period of, of open door um, hospitality, as it were, for, for artists, of, of all um, shapes and sizes and colors and hues. So it would only make sense that these composers who were really trying to get at the heart of American music, the cornerstone, would go where it lives. Why would you not do that? Uh, exactly. Uh, again, when we talk about um, cultures being brought together from, from the beginnings of this country uh, un until now, that period represented um, 
America at its best and its worst. Interestingly enough, when we're under times that are very trying, uh, the art that emerges from that is often um, really phenomenal. So again, this was, you know, we can look at, at the difficulties of, of those times, that, uh, whether they were social, racial, economic. Somehow we managed to identify ourselves and, and find some form of identity in the art that we create. And there's going to be this, this uh, sharing of, of, um, of art and, and, and creativity and communication uh, almost um, just by the fact that we're all attempting to survive uh, under these conditions. And that was one of the interesting unions that was, that was born out of all of this. And when you put that together, you get Americana, you get a unique American sound, you get what we call American jazz. And that could not have happened under any other circumstances than the ones which did uh, usher in all of these different experiences that, that we talk about. Absolutely, absolutely. And one more question, and then we'd love for you to, even though we're gonna go over time, we'd love for you to finish with your Yaparberg song. Constance would like to know if you could name some Jewish jazz musicians who are playing today. Um, well, of course, you know, Randy Brecker, who's um, you know kind of my vintage, and it's, of course his brother who passed away, were just um, amazing musicians. You know John Zorn. Um, there has been um, a resurgence of interest in jazz, klezmer jazz, mixing jazz with the accordion, the sound of Eastern European music, um, mm -hmm. which really comes to us from from New York, um, and we call the Knitting Factory, and, and the loft music from the 80s and 90s. Probably John Zorn is is one of the most widely known alto saxophonists mm -hmm. and um, exactly. but when it comes to to to, to playing jazz I, I I gotta tell you that the only thing that matters is can you play and the bebop musicians you know if if you could play you could get on the bandstand and play with those guys and if you couldn't play they would wouldn't shun you but you knew that you did something that earned their ire I think that that's what we do as jazz musicians. We, um, we live by um, the, our ability to manipulate the sounds in, in, in such a manner that it, it is of the time and, and of the art. Sure. So um, I, I think, I hope that, that answers your question. <laughs> it makes no difference. Right now, there is great jazz being played all over the world. There's some of the greatest jazz musicians. You know, the United States does not have a, um, what was I gonna say, um, uh, when you own all the rights to something. I'm having a moment. Well, what's that? Monopoly. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> we don't have a monopoly on jazz anymore. This is a world music. Some of the greatest musicians are coming from Northern Europe, coming from South Africa, coming from South America, Central America, from Canada from Asia, Japan, and China, Singapore. Some of the great, great musicians. So it's, it's all over. And, it, it, and we always ask, can you play? Can she play? Can he play? Can you speak the language? And that's, what it, that's what's going on here. It's about a language that we can all speak. So we're going to leave you with Old Devil Moon. Thank you so much for letting us come into your I guess your chat room, wherever you want to call it. You know, we all we do Zoom. I do all my classes, my lessons on Skype and Zoom, and it's, you know, this is things are going to be very different, as you said. You know, once this is all over and we get the back to some sense of normalcy, hopefully people will just be so hungry to go out and hear live entertainment, see sports, and do all the things that we just really can't do right now. I think that there, I'm hoping there's going to be a great cultural explosion in a positive way. That's what I would, would like to see in a very positive way. So let's leave you with uh, Yarberg's. Um, oh, and the guy who wrote the music to this, he, he went under the, under the name Burton Lane. Burton Levy is his real name. So Burton Levy wrote the music. Harburg writes the lyrics. Um, so we're going to leave you with Old Devil Moon. Thank you.
to thank Gordon and Gary and thank all of you for sticking with us tonight. I want to thank our technicians, Dan and Charlie. And once again, thank you for joining us and join us again soon. Good night. Good night.